Hey TikTok fam. Um, so proof that I'm actually going back through and answering your questions. This was one from ages ago and I'm so sorry. I haven't replied to it yet, but I've been wanting to because it's such a good question. Um, a lot of you have asked what, at what point did I start thinking life would be better on the outside? I didn't know. I don't, I didn't know that life would be better on the outside because I knew what the costs were to leave, how much you had to lose in terms of the family, your family, your whole world, and starting all over again. And remember, all my life, I was brainwashed to believe that life isn't better out there. You're better off to die than to leave. So it's such extreme thoughts that you think, oh my God, like it must be awful out there. The people, and you're taught that the people outside will, you know, leave you destitute in a gutter. Pushing up drugs is basically my dad's analogy of the, the outsiders, you know, non-brethren members, you guys. And the irony, the sadness of all this is that the people that have shown me the most love and support are random strangers, are beautiful humans that I've connected with over TikTok, for example. And it's, it's crazy that, that the people that I needed protecting from all my life, apparently, that my parents taught me, are the ones that are showing the very things my own family, my own parents didn't show me. So I guess there were certain points at which I was like, I need to get out of here. The first point was when I realized I was gay and then discovered that homosexuality is accepted in the real world generally. And the second point was that I had so many conditions whereby I would be loved. So if I wore this, then it was, then I was loved. If I, if I did this, followed this rule, participated in this, I was loved. Conditioned. Everything I had to do to be a family member was on condition. It was never just you as you are, authentic self, we love you. And that's what I get now. So, and then I think the last night of my life in there, my brother had been out drinking with his cousins or our cousins and came home and, and violently um, attacked me got physical. And that's when I thought I need to get out of here. This is physical. And then not long before that, a cousin had spoken to me and said that she'd been sexually abused, raped, and nothing had been done. And this wasn't the first time I'd heard about a rape or a sexual abuse. So it was at that point, I thought the people they're protecting us from are the wrong people that they need to be protecting us from. They need to be protecting us from themselves. And this is not a community I could even raise a family in or or healthily live in like, so it was, I think they were the main instigators as to why I left. Hey, TikTok family, and welcome back to how I escaped the exclusive brethren and more info about the exclusive brethren, um, a cult here in Australia. And if you're unaware of them, well, follow my channel and you'll find out just exactly what they're like. Um, and my experiences in the 24 years I lived braved, that life. Um, I escaped it seven years ago. My parents are still in it. My family's still in it. It's a generational cult, 148, 150 years old, uh, about 60,000 members worldwide. And I'm sharing my experiences here in Australia. Um, I know that everyone's experiences are different worldwide, but the cult has the same rules globally. One, one religion, one, one <laughs> definition of rules, one book of rules for want of a better expression. Um, this question I've seen a lot and or comment and it's a great, great comment. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and keep them coming because I'm getting back to them all. Like I said, it's just, there's a lot. Um, and I've got a lot going on, which I can't wait to share with you guys. Um, I'm going to keep that from you, but I will, I will share it soon. I just don't want to count my chickens before they hatch or ruin anything. So, um, anyway, back to the question. So, this is, I don't get how intelligent people don't question the system. I'm assuming that's what that one said. Um, the thing is, yes, they are, there are very intelligent people in there. I didn't actually think that I was like that smart. I didn't do super well at school. I mean, I was in a class full of brilliant women that were very intelligent, but I didn't really you know, from that, I didn't think I was the smartest. So, I mean, I'm the only one that's left from my class. So, well, on my own merits. Um, 
So I guess that speaks for itself. But intelligent people are in there, but fear takes what I've what I believe. I believe fear is far surpasses intelligence. You can be an intelligent person, but you'll fear. And if you have fear that's strong enough, and and these fears that the brethren indoctrinate in you from birth and have for generations, if they are your guiding force um, or your your compass, they they will far up surpass your intelligence. So yes, they're intelligent people, and of course, the leader leader is intelligent. The the elders, the leader, the leadership is intelligent. It's a genius system. You have got all these people under your control. It's brilliant. It's genius. And, you know, you can live a luxurious lifestyle because of the, the um, accumulated wealth across all brethren. So more on that. But yes, there are intelligent people in there. How often and how easy is it for women to leave? And is it easier for men to leave? Yes. And great question. Here's why. So predominantly men leave or you'll find it's men in... Like women will leave when they're in relationships, um, but with with that though, I've found a, a strange difference of late. Like it's becoming more so women leave as well because at the end of the day, it's usually women. Like this this culture, this cult is built for men. It is you know it serves the interests of men, um, of straight, predominantly white men. And you know what I think about that? So um, it's, it's not built for women. It's built, women are built in that, uh, uh, their, their role in that is to serve, basically. Um, so they ha- have more reason to be disgruntled, more reason to leave. They don't, aren't allowed to be career focused and they will showcase a couple here and there to say, yes, they have careers, they have that option. No, it's not, it's frowned upon. So why would you do something that that would already ostracize you in a very toxic community? You wouldn't do something different because you don't want to stand out, you want to fit in because you're already under scrutiny constantly. So women are, you know, as I've explained, to be housewives, basically, stay at home, cook, clean and have the babies because like I've explained, they don't have cult members come in um, or they don't recruit. So they kind of keep it within their big family, um, their chosen family by God. So, but it's easier for, for men to leave because men are equipped with dealing with the outside world because they're doing business that they usually, you know, are business minded, know how to work in the workforce and get a job. And so with the girls that I've helped leave, I've helped one, two, three, four, five, about five or six girls leave. And it's, it's been difficult because they don't know how to write a resume. They don't like not all. Um, and, and the thing is the women are usually the smarter ones. Um, so the women have more reason to leave than the men because they, it's not a society where they, um, you know, they're, they're constantly, they're flogged. Like, to death with, with the workload. They're constantly entertaining. They're constantly having guests. They're constantly, you know, it's, it's a, it's a tough life to be a woman in it. And then they don't have any say. And if they do, well, they're put back in their place. Um, it's easier. Yes. So it's easier for men and predominantly men leave, um, than it is for women, but I'm always here for the women. If you need a place of refuge, I'll protect you. Hey there, just thought I'd answer this question, although it's not really a question, it's a statement. Okay, you're saying that you work for a brethren business and it's nowhere near as strict as all the videos say. Well, this for a start is my experience. And yes, a lot may have changed in seven years, but I'm still in contact with people in there. I still have friends and family in there. So nothing has changed. They still hide abuses. They you're still not allowed to hang out with outsiders. Why would they tell somebody they work with a non brethren who, you know, you're considered less fortunate because you're not in the cult. They don't divulge what goes on behind closed doors at home. And I can assure you work life is very different to home life. They don't carry on with the same manipulative, abusive, controlling behavior in the workforce because They've had too many people go to fair trading or stand up against them, outsiders who don't put up with that shit. And you might just be working with somebody or a family 
um, higher up in the society who can get away with being more friendly and showing you what a breezy, easy life it is. Um, no, I, you're seeing a very skewed perception of what the exclusive brethren cult is like. Um, yes, you might learn so much, but have you ever considered they might be telling you exactly what they want you to hear? Um, so yeah, I'm, I don't know where this is coming from and I respect your opinion, but it's a very unheard of. I have a myriad of people I can, that can vouch for working, what it was like working for the brethren, even though they weren't members. Like uh, there's somebody on here that I've been talking to and she probably will comment, um, about her experiences working for a brethren and she wasn't a brethren. Like it, it's what you're experiencing is very unusual and they would probably be reprimanded that that family you work for, for being so friendly with you or being so nice to you because that's not, that's not okay. Like that's in the brethren community. You don't be that cordial or friendly with outsiders. You don't what they call break down the, the barrier of separation, you maintain that. So you're seeing a very skewed perception of reality and that's only one-sided. This question again is kind of a heavy one. How do the brethren justify engaging lawyers in child custody? Okay, they look at it like this. Anyone that leaves the cult is, all your life you're taught to better, you're better off to die than to leave. So anyone that leaves, there's no guarantee that they'll be saved in the next life, right? There's no guarantee that um, the world won't get them and just ravage them. So in their mind, they think they're doing God's work by engaging the most expensive lawyers to to rip the children away from the mothers that try to leave. And that's the biggest thing. I know somebody in there that just can't leave because they're threatened that, that they will keep the children. They will take the kids away. And I've seen, I've witnessed this firsthand with a relative of mine that has left and they've, they've thrown all sorts of legal um, expenses at her to try and manipulate the, the situation so that the kids are, are you know, with them. And regardless of the father, regardless, you know, uh, not this case specifically, but the father could, or we've seen it actually um, in a recent case, I think her name's Heidi. And if you go to um, the ex-brethren, there's an ex-brethren Facebook um, or YouTube, Get A Life podcast, which I did a, a story with recently. They're a great follow. Um, if you want to look it up, it's on YouTube, Get A Life podcast. And her name's Heidi, and she's told her story on how um, the brethren have, you know, tried to outprice her with lawyers, and that's what they do. They'll try and keep the children from you because, and, and I've heard firsthand them say to the woman leaving, you just go, go and do your thing. We'll keep the kids. Like, what mother would do that anyway? Um, so, yes, that's, they justify it because in their mind they're doing God's work, and we're saving another soul regardless of the repercussions of keeping a child and fostering it out amongst the brethren. Because I think legally you can foster out for a month, you know, unofficial fostering, I think they call it. But I need to look into this more because brethren kids are, majority that I've spoken to that have been fostered out within the brethren have had sexual abuse and to the point of rape. And it's not legal if it's more than a month. So I think can I do it for a month, but I'd appreciate if somebody else knows anything on this commenting. But yeah, so there's a lot of things that happen. So this question is, are the brethren allowed to divorce? No, not at all. Like the Catholic Church, divorce is heavily frowned upon and they will do anything and everything, pay you money to stop you from divorcing or leaving your husband. It's because it's usually, it's never the husbands that want to leave the wives. It's always the women that are with the most awful men you could think of. They are, yes, I won't even get into that. So, no, and I know this firsthand of people I've helped leave, that they will try everything when the women, the woman tries to divorce. Um, there's only one case I know of that has ever got a divorce, and allegedly it's because, you know, from what I've heard, that her husband was an abuser, like horrific abuser, 
And this woman stood up to them and said, I'm going to go to the police if you don't let me get a divorce. And so she fled back home and they allowed her to get a divorce. But that's only like recent times. This is how many women have been, you know, subjected to horrific abuses, which is unfortunately the case with the brethren um, and just being told to suck it up. And this is God's plan and you must figure it out or you must just endure it. It's the suffering way. It's got what God has put, put in place for you. You know, God tests you and tries you and, you know, it's, Ugh, I want to punch them in the face. No, if you're in an abusive situation, there is a whole legal system here and a whole world of us ex leavers here that will help you and support you get out of that abusive situation. You don't have to put up with shit. So it just, sorry, I get super passionate about this because I've had so many relatives affected by this and I've seen so many that are, um, that are still in there. And I hope one day they might see this and realize that you don't have to be subjected to your abusive husband or you don't have to do anything you don't want to do as an adult. It's called consent. And that's one thing they do not teach you about in the brethren is consent. They don't even give you a sex education, let alone telling you they, they basically, when you get married, it's like the husband owns you and whatever he wants to do, you subject. And this is the, the women that speak up are called insubordinate or a non-subject wife. You know, you're better off to put a millstone around your neck and th cast yourself into the sea. How about we put the millstone around the abusers' necks and cast them into the sea? What a better place this world would be. Thank you, family. So this question says that are the brethren children not allowed to associate with children not in the order? Yes. So regardless, you're ba baptized at birth. So you are held to that baptism and that baptism includes the doctrine of separation. So you, you know, they, they, they believe there are peculiar people zealous for good works. Um, let him that names the name of the Lord to Timothy two, withdraw from iniquity. So they believe the world outsiders are iniquitous. So we withdraw from them. And because you don't, you know, outsiders don't go to the same supper meeting ritual that they have every, have every Sunday morning where they break bread in representation of Christ's body and drink alcohol um, in representation of his blood, because outsiders don't do that with them, they are not included or allowed to eat with them. So it's, it, yes, children have to be separate. So growing up in primary school, when I went to a non-brethren school for recess, me and the other brethren kids were had a strict like carpet mat we had to sit on away from the other kids. And then at lunchtime, there was a roster between our mums and they would come and pick us up from the primary school and take us home for lunch and then bring us back. And, you know, as if we weren't already alienated or ostracized because the girls used to have to wear hankies on their heads and they were called hanky heads. And us boys were never allowed to go to, you know, play sports or go to carnivals or go to, you know, kids parties. So we were called Bible bashers. So being ostracized already for our religion. And, you know, we weren't allowed to watch any of the movies the kids were watching or do Christmas or religion. We had to all, you know, constantly made a spectacle of. On top of that, we were taken home for lunch. So kids, we were bullied badly. And then you got put into a brethren school for high school where if you're not high up in the echelon of the brethren status quo, you're bullied again. So, um, yeah, there's, you're not safe wherever, wherever you are unless you're, you know, super wealthy and high up close to the Hales family, the leading family in the Brethren, um, or have some connection to. So, yes, good question, but no. Regardless whether you're a kid or an adult, you are not allowed to associate with other outsiders that aren't in the Brethren cult. Um, so, getting back to your questions, have the police ever got involved in the Brethren criminal activity like the assaults against myself or others. So no, and to be honest, not, not in my, like my life, I haven't pursued any of that um, yet because it was a time where I was, you know, if you spoke about that to your mother or father, they're just like, you're an adult, you know, you're a man now, you don't, don't worry about that. Like that's just boys will be boys kind of activity. Um, and I know there are ongoing um, cases though with, with certain people, um, that, you know, have had severe assaults and not that mine wasn't severe. Um, it was just, you know, that yes, there are, and there are people that have been brought to justice and, you know, I 
hope to support any victim that has ever been abused or assaulted um, in bringing the the abusers to justice. I am here for that journey. And that is why I'm sharing my story because somebody might be in a similar situation um, or a worse situation and doesn't know how to deal with it. And the law is on your side. I'm telling you this, that the law is here to protect you. The brethren will never protect you. They say, and they teach you that, um, you know, we, we will look after you with, you know, that they'll try and tell you that the sorry that's happened and we'll look after you, but it doesn't stop the abuser. He goes on abusing. And I say he, because it's usually the men. I've never heard of a woman doing it. So, um, yes, if you, if you are in a situation like that, there are a myriad of us out here, ex brethren members, not bitter members that you've been told or apostate mem people. We're just normal humans that give a fuck about the right thing. Um, and we're here to help you and not afraid of the brethren because we know we have the police and the law on our side and we've been advised that. So if you are in there and trapped, feel free to reach out to myself or anyone else outside that you know, and we will be here to help you. Um, and don't ever think for a moment that we wouldn't take your side because I am sick and tired of hearing that the brethren are just saying, where's your proof? and victim shaming, basically gaslighting people into believing that um, their story isn't valid, their abuse isn't valid. If you are and have been abused, know that we will do everything in our power to help bring justice to this. This one says, um, if they have lo super low key non-event weddings, do the newlyweds get to go on a honeymoon? No, because that's a celebration. Basically, celebrations are out. But yeah, so no, they basically get married, non-event, back into life, back into routine of church every night, of having people in your house. And somebody asked, and I'll answer this question here as well, why do they always have people into their house? Like, why do you have to? It's that keeping you accountable. It's that control because obviously the leadership, the eldership are only a small minority group within that minority. Um, they can't be in control all the time. So they, they rely, kind of like Hitler did on his Gestapo, rely on, you know, everyone else to implode and attack on each other um, and, and secretly, you know, get each other in trouble. And it happens within your own family. Like, I remember, you know, incidences where my own brothers and sisters, uh, brother and sisters were, um, you know, reporting on my activities and I have proof of this because my grandfather used to write it down in like a, you know, a case file. They have like case files on people and my family did on me. And, you know, out here, if you have a problem with somebody, you go to the person, right? I mean, we call that bitching if you do it behind somebody's back. I mean, we all do it. Let's be real. But that's not the point. You know, you're meant to be this peculiar people, zealous for good works up on this pedestal, but your actions show otherwise. And yeah, so it's, it's a system built basically to report each other, keep each other accountable um, in the most toxic way possible. Now I know of people that had honeymoons or that went to a hotel and stayed there the night and, and celebrated, like they have been dealt with, so to speak, they're, 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 you get punished. They were punished. They were reprimanded over their worldly behavior. Um, any behavior that's outsiders or the, the general world go on with, which what you'd call normal, like reading a fucking book or watching a bloody movie is worldly behavior and heavily frowned upon. And you will be reprimanded. You will be in trouble for. So the, the constant pressure, the constant guilt trips that you have for unnecessary normal human behaviors it is what makes this environment so damn toxic. And I should add also what makes it's such a cycle, such a, a toxic cycle to break because you're constantly that hard on yourself because everyone else was. The people you loved were. Good morning and welcome back. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Ben Woodbury and I'm discussing how I and why I escaped the exclusive brethren uh, seven years ago. Um, if you haven't heard of them, they're probably, you probably know them as brothers or brethren or peeves um, or Plymouth Brethren Christian Church as they've rebranded. Yes, here in Australia. Um, and I think they're a cult. So hear me out and you'll know why. 
Okay, great question. Why are all their marriages on a Tuesday? And I was hoping somebody would like pick up on this because sometimes I'm like, I wanna, I've got so many stories to tell, right? But I've, I'm waiting for the questions. So, you know, I want to involve you guys in this journey. Um, so <laughs> why are they all married on a Tuesday? And I forgot this happens. I, I've been to weddings out here and they're like great, beautiful, ceremonious affairs and, and, you know, shows of affirmations of love. Whereas in there, it's very official, like a presentation of a male and a female bonded together. And as I explained in the, in the, the previous video where this question stemmed from, um, marriage is purely not, is, is loveless. And as I was told by a very prominent leading brother, um, that, you know, love comes after marriage and that that's, that's their general belief. And that came from, you know, nearly at the top. So why are all their marriages on a Tuesday? Great question. I actually had to have a think for a moment because they, they usually have a scripture to back all this up, right? Because, you know, in case anybody questions it like this, you can go, well, and here's why. So from what I've worked out, it was convenient to have it on a Tuesday because this is where they have on a Tuesday. Like I've said, we have had church every night of the week on Tuesday night. They'd have two brothers, men get up and preach, which they would call a word. So Tuesday night was called the word, um, cause it's the word of God and coming through two random guys too bad. If one of them was a rapist or a predator, you know, it's the word of God. It doesn't choose. Um, it doesn't judge is what I meant to say. Um, so their marriages are on a Tuesday because it was convenient because that was sort of the type of meeting that aligned with how a wedding was. Cause the weddings are, are just, boring little meeting church things and not very fancy. They just do a wedding in the church and then that's it. I think now they even just get married at home and it's like at the parents' house and no, nothing. Like there's no cake, there's no flowers, there's no bridesmaids, there's no beautiful wedding. It's simple and organized. Now, the other thing, the scripture that, that they kind of link this to is on the third day, uh, Jesus went to a wedding in Cana or something. I don't know one of the villages and where he turned the water into wine. So that was on the third day. So Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the third day, apparently sometimes they're having them on a Wednesday. So I wonder if there's like a communication error or some people are thinking Wednesday's the third day, but yeah, great question. Do you think the cult influenced your view of women? It sounds very gendered and sexist. Was it difficult to overcome those ideas? Okay. I think I started the unlearning of all the indoctrination I knew from the moment kind of my world shifted in terms of perspectives and realities, because like I've explained earlier in my videos, I was nine years old when I realized I was gay. So I had a lot of like, I can't change this. What is this about? Um, and, and a lot of that I think stemmed or influenced me to question my reality, my current circumstances, the people I lived with, the teachings they taught me as much as I, you know, it was a huge culture shock and a massive change and an uprooting of beliefs and thoughts and, and ideas. Um, yes, it, it did influence uh, my thinking. I, I didn't, I don't, I don't think I am or was as supportive or as not that I wasn't supportive. I just, I didn't have the understanding or the knowledge that I have now when it comes to, um, you know, ideas on sex on, um, yeah, like I think I used my identity crisis, so so to speak, the fact that I was gay as as a fulcrum in my life. Like, well, if this if this is wrong, as in what they the brethren taught me about being gay was wrong, then everything else they've taught me, I'm like, I questioned it. So when they had views on women should not, you know, should be seen and not heard, kind of thing, I questioned it. I was always. No, I, I like women. I loved women that spoke out. I loved women that, that, you know, questioned men and because it was foreign, it was unusual. And so it, there have been things that have been over, hard to overcome. Like they're very racist and they're very um, homophobic, which I, I kind of was homophobic. I hated that part of me. So I've had to, if I've ever got an issue with anything, I look, I, I sit there and go, even today I go, where is this thought coming from and where did I learn this teaching? And like, before I say it or do it, I'm like, okay, so why, or like, why do I think like that? If something makes me uncomfortable or, you know, triggers something from my past, I, I think, okay, that was something I was taught. It's definitely most likely probably incorrect. 
and then I analyze it and re reshape my shift, my thinking. So yes, it's a constant work in progress. Um, yeah, great question. Very thought provoking. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of questions about, are they similar to the Mormon culture or in, in ways of using the church members for their business? So in the brethren, and I've had a few people ask about Jehovah's Witness in terms of like rules and laws and their beliefs, they're very similar to Jehovah's Witness, except they don't, it's not Jehovah. It's like they believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But, you know, like Jehovah's Witness, they don't, they don't celebrate birthdays, Christmas, Easter. Um, and they have the, the, the discipline or the, the punishments they inflict on the members in terms of excommunication. So once you leave, um, you know, you're not, you're not welcome back and your family's banned from speaking to you or having to do with you. Um, and the difference with Jehovah's Witness though, I know I'm straying from the Mormon question, but difference with Jehovah's Witness is Jehovah's Witness at 14, I think you're allowed to choose to be baptized. Whereas the brethren, they baptize you at birth. So you're held like this contract, you're held to this contract of your baptism. So if you stray at, at all, you're punished, disciplined. Um, that's the difference. But with Mormon, I don't really know much about the Mormons. Um, I should research more, <laughs> but in terms of using members for their business, they're paid well. I mean, their lifestyles are very expensive anyway, but the brethren wage is, you know, great, but all in, in terms of, or in balance to a very expensive lifestyle, you have to provide the best food. You have to provide the best alcohol. You have to wear the best, drive the best, house has to be the best. But this is new. This teaching is new under the current leadership and the previous leadership, the Hales reign, they call it. That, that's, this is a new, living an ostentatious life, a luxurious lifestyle is new. It's not, it's not classic traditional brethren where it was simple and, you know, um, vanity was frowned upon. Whereas now the girls cut their hair a bit more. They, you know, you'll see a few wear makeup, never jewelry or accessories, but, you know, they will wear the flashier clothes or the knees, you know, the, the skirts above the knees or at the knees rather than the long, you know, um, conservative look that they've always been known for, the long denim skirts, the long head scarves, the long hair. Um, they're a bit more um, modern, for want of a better word, without being modern at all. You can still spot them a mile away. But so back to the question. I, I don't really know much about the Mormon, but I've had a lot of these questions. They use their members, but they pay them. And it's all within that control, the way of we're giving you this, you're giving us that, and we're giving you a bit more. So we'll hold you to that. Um, thank you for your questions. If you got any more, hit me up and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I've got so many to reply to, but I love the interest. Thank you. Hey, TikTok, I have to share with you these funny, funny stories that you guys are telling me your perspective of what it was like living next door to somebody in that cult, the one that I was raised in. And so some of you have like lived in the same street as these cult members or next door to, and some of your stories are hilarious because it's obviously an outside perspective and you're like, this is very cult like behavior, what's going on? So one of the, one of the common stories I'm hearing is about bin night. So apparently on bin night, and I know this is true because my dad used to do it, um, after, you know, the brethren entertain a lot, always have guests over. And after they have these like big dinners and like lunches that I've just talked about, um, where <laughs> at, at bin night, the, the dad of the house would sneak out at night from the garage loads with loads of like rubbish and bags and, and put them in all the neighbor's bins. Um, that seems to be a common story. And yes, I'm sorry. My dad used to do that. Um, that was purely because they had so much rubbish or leftovers from entertaining. And then the other thing is, <laughs> so, <laughs> so funny. Okay. So the brethren don't use hairdressers. All right. Hairdressers are a no-no and women, you know, God takes pleasure in the length of or the hair of a woman. So basically don't cut your hair, um, particularly well, for the women anyway. So that's why they have traditionally like quite long hair, but back in the day, I know some good hairdressers, but it's frowned on, you're not allowed to, but Back in the day, I remember like my, my, my mum, I can just imagine how funny this would have looked from like a neighbor's perspective. So someone messaged and messaged me and someone else has asked about this, right? They used to notice their brother and neighbors. The girls would come out in the backyard, like on a Saturday afternoon with a towel around their shoulders with their hair wet. And the mum would have like a flame and burn the end of their hair. 
Okay, it's like an 1800s, probably even older method of, you know, trimming your hair and get rid of, getting rid of dead ends um, and split ends. And they basically, my mum used to do it to my sisters, when the hair was wet, I think it was wet, they would like burn the, singe the ends of the hair to get rid of it. And then like, because you weren't allowed to cut it, so you, you know, just used to keep it neat and trim that way. But yes, that's what you're witnessing. It wasn't like a cult ritual. It's just a very old school method of um, maintaining your hair because you weren't allowed, you know, it was sinful to go to a hairdresser. So, <laughs> but I just think it's funny hearing these stories from an outside perspective, um, knowing what was happening. Um, yeah, keep, thanks, thanks for all these messages, guys. This is a big one and a deep one, and I'll probably have to do two, three, four parts on it. Or if you've got heaps of questions surrounding this, feel free to ask because I have heard so many stories about this. I've experienced some things myself and witnessed other things happen to other people. So this question specifically is about, talk. it says, talk about how teenagers get moved to other brethren communities. Okay. It's not just teenagers, but I'll stick to teenagers, but it, it, it's also kids. So, for example, my cousin's family, when their parents weren't, you know, were kicked out for a moment, they will take the kids off you and palm them out, like foster them out within the community, the brethren community. And unfortunately, most people I've spoken to that have had experienced this have been sexually abused. And that's a huge statement to make, but every single person I know that has been fostered out as kids has had some form of sexual abuse happen to them. And it's, it's makes me fucking livid. So as a teenager, I was, because this question is specifically about teenagers, so I'll share my experience. When I came out at 18, I went through this whole whirlwind roller coaster of, of grappling with my own identity, the conversion therapy that they try and give you. Um, I knew pre a previous person that had come out. He had been given um, chemical, like drugs to chemically castrate him, which is basically what you give, they give to, you know, victim um, abusers, like sex offenders, um, major ones. And they, they, gave them to a teenager. So I was, had all of this to deal with knowing also trying to hide the fact that I was gay. So I had a lot and I was up and down with my mental health, with the, even just wanting to exist. Um, so I was sent around as an, an you become an encouragement case. So I was sent to live with cousins for a few months, some other cousins for a few months. And with that comes this stigma that you, you know, are a bit mental, like you need help, like you need encouragement. And often they will send you like we had, because we were the area where the leader lived, we got sent a lot of, um, people from other countries and they lived here and they were always picked on or bullied because they were different. Um, so great question. And there's so much more on this I need to get into, but I only have three minutes. And you've asked what was that, what was it like going to an exclusive brethren school? And like many other victims of this cult, we'll explain to you, it's the worst fucking years of your life. Um, if you're bullied at school, you're bullied at church, you're bullied in the school bus. Brethren have their own schools, their own transport to get to school. And you go to school five times a week and then you go to church seven times a week. So you can imagine what the bullying was like. It was incessant. And if there was no love or support at home, or you didn't have a, in my case, I had a very toxic family environment. So I, I you can understand why I, I, you know, didn't, didn't want to live. I didn't, this life was not enjoyable. It was the worst experience I, I've ever had today. And then you've also asked about the Hales family and do they have strict control over the brethren? Yes, they do. I don't have enough time in this video to get into all of that, but the Hales family are basically the leader is a Hales, uh, his name is Bruce Hales, and therefore his family are kind of like the royal family. So whatever happens up the top sort of filters out through the bottom. And that comes with, with trends, with rules, with fashion, with what type of car you drive. It all starts here, kind of very communist-like, and everyone else follows suit. So basically the Hales family farts, and you're like, wow, what is that fragrance? It smells amazing. 
that's pretty much it. So they get new cars and before long you start to see it trickle down through the, the layers of society within the Brethren where they all start to drive the Land Rovers. Or before that it was the Mazda um, CX-9s or whatever it was. Um, and same with houses, um, same with, you know, they, they've started to get interior designers, so therefore, or they did, and other brethren start to do that now. And, and you know, the way you decorate your house becomes a thing. Um, same with fashion, like the, the Hales family, you know, wear a certain type of look, the women in particular, and then all of a sudden you see the others doing it. The rest of the cult sort of follow along. So, and I remember, so my old boss, he's he married the, the Hales leader's daughter, so he was like the son-in-law. Um, and I remember him saying to me, cause he was kind of my priest at one point, And he said to me, you do realize that I've married into the Royal family. Like it's the Royal family. And I'm like, yeah, I, I do realize that I get it. Like that it, it's the same system. Um, but the thing is with Royalists and Royal families, they're a thing of the past. And well, I believe so. Yes. My life at school was the worst experience I've ever had. And the Hales family control the whole of the, the exclusive brethren and influence it. Um, but there's so much more I could talk about on this. But like I said, I've only got three minutes. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hey, everyone. I just want to share with you today. I went to the collective plant fair um, and I got these beautiful hippie astrums. I was so triggered by them. I was like, I have to get them. Um, they were my mum and I's favorite flower growing up and they were in my childhood home. So I figured I would get some and write a note on the bag and leave it on my mum's doorstep. If you haven't already or aren't aware of having been following my story, I grew up in the Exclusive Brethren, or as it's more commonly rebranded, the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. And after escaping that environment seven years ago, um, I was obviously consequently excommunicated. Now, if you don't know what that means, once you leave that church, your family treats it like a death. So I have nothing to do with my family and they're not allowed to have anything to do with me. Um, obviously I would love to, but it's against their rules. And um, so every now and then I drop off something at my parents' house for my mom, because I obviously love her dearly and miss her incredibly. But I one time was caught by my dad at the door and he told me um, we'd really appreciate it if you didn't show up here anymore because it leaves mum, you know, in a, you know, it really affects your mother and leaves her, you know, really affected for um, two weeks. I'm like, oh, really? Well, how do you think I feel? I don't see any of my family. So obviously I'm not going to listen to my dad. Um, and my mum probably didn't say that at all. So um, I've written her a note. It says, dear mom, I brought you these in memory of the love we shared and happy, happier times in our childhood home. Our favorite flowers from Golden Grove, your ever loving son, Ben. And I'm hoping she will, I'm hoping my dad won't catch these on the doorstep before she does. Um, I'll let you know, I'll, I'll stay tuned and I'll keep you updated how that goes. Wish me luck. So I've just arrived at my parents' place and I'm going to drop this off and we'll see how we go. Um, I doubt they'll answer the door because they've probably most likely seen my car and yeah. Wish me luck. So as expected, they weren't there. Well, they didn't answer the door. Um, and I left it on the doorstep and I sent my mum a message, text message with a photo um, like this. And as you can see, I said, hey mum, hope you're well. Just thought I'd let you know I dropped off a package at your door. I was at a plant fair today and saw some hippie astrums like the one we loved at Golden Grove, thought you might like it as a memory or some of the happier memories we shared. Love you always, Ben. I sent her a photo and all I got was a thank you. And just showing you that the last time she messaged me was saying happy birthday, praying for you all the time. And that is literally the minimal contact, not even the bare minimum that I have to do with her. Um, and the rest of the messages I will get into because that's another story for another day. <laughs> so the question was, do any families ignore the rule? And the rule here we, were, we are talking about um, is speaking to your family or outsiders once they've left ex-members. So yes, my mum used to secretly text me. There's no way in hell she would have told my dad or any other member because she would have been reprimanded or 
you know, disciplined as they call it. Um, and I remember meeting up secretly with my sister once, but no, and she would never have told anyone. And yes, she, they, they do ignore the rule, but secretly, they will secretly keep in contact. But it, it's such an overwhelming um, guilt trip because the people that leave are, are the epitome of evil, like me for leaving that church or cult. Um, I'm an apostate because I talk out against it, because I stand up to these bullies, these manipulators, these abusers. So I am an apostate um, because of that. So yes, some families do ignore it, but only in secret, because the consequences of speaking to an outsider or an ex-member, even if it's family, are so, so bad. The consequences are so significant that it's not worth um, telling anyone about it. So thanks for the questions, guys, and keep them coming. Thank you so much and great question. Um, yes, they keep you very, very busy and very, very separate. Yes, my family are all still in it. Um, and due to their really strict rules or laws of separation um, and me being excommunicated, they're not allowed or they're banned from having to do with me or speak to me. Um, I do reach out to my mum from time to time, but I just get like sort of one word answers back or nothing really from my sisters, my brother and my dad. I, I never hear from um, or my cousins, aunties, grandparents, anyone. And they firmly believe in, I think, 2 Timothy 2, where it says, let him that names the name of the Lord withdraw from iniquity. So once you have left that church or that religion or cult, um, you are then excommunicated and therefore you are, are iniquitous. So they have to withdraw from you. And that process, as official as it sounds, um, is quite a um, huge life-changing thing for them, for, for, for you that leaves and for those that you leave behind. Um, because all your life you were taught you're better off to die than to leave. So for your family that you leave behind, they treat your leaving like a death. So they grieve you like you died because essentially they're never going to speak to you again or see you again because they're not allowed to. And on top of that, um, yet yeah, leaving them in front of them um, is very painful and traumatic. So you're left with that trauma as well. Um, so thank you for the question and feel free to ask any more questions. Thanks, guys. Hi. Um, interesting comment. Not sure about the tone, but I'll, share, I'll fill you in a bit more on the details of my escape. Um, and as it was my journey, that's what it felt like. Yes, it wasn't a prison as in a jail or literal bars. It was a house I lived in seamlessly integrated in society. Yes, I didn't escape it in terms of an actual prison, but hun, <laughs> the prison here is the prison of the mind. Now they control everything from the, where you live, who you're allowed to associate with, um, who you're allowed to marry, and where you're allowed to go, where you're allowed to work, what you're allowed to study, um, who you're allowed to eat with, pretty much what you wear, and your finances. So tell me, does that sound like a prison? Yeah, it is. It is a prison. And and I say escape because your family don't just let you go. They don't just like, all right, you don't want to believe in this religion anymore. That's fine. Let's, let's you know, let you go and we'll still be in touch. No, it's I had to plan it for years. I had to plan to get my finances under my control. I had to plan to have a secure income and job so that I could support myself out here. I had to plan to get a network of friends and family out here. And I had to plan how I was going to leave because I knew all your life you were taught it's better off to die than to leave. So I knew that my family were going to react to my leaving like a death. They were going to react like that. And I, I left in front of them, which I've advised everyone that's ever wanted to leave the exclusive brethren, don't leave in front of your family, do it secretly, because it was the most traumatic thing to date that I've ever witnessed. My mum clawing at me, screaming, fainting, my sisters crying, because to them, they're watching their brother, the last fleeting moments of his life, because to them, they've been taught too that it's better off to die than to leave. And my father praying, my, my brother not knowing what to do, my whole family responding to me just being an adult at 24 year old wanting to leave home because A, I couldn't be a gay man, I couldn't be true or authentic to myself and B, I, I didn't agree with the, the things that were going on there. And because of that, they, they respond to it like a death and therefore I had to escape. 
And as much as it wasn't bars and a prison and guards, essentially it is. And, and the hardest things in life that we battle with are in our minds, not physically. So yes, it was. I, it was an escape. And I won't let you undermine my story. The question is, is there a network of people such as myself or safe houses nationally that that can provide refuge for new refugees or escapees, not refugees, sorry. Um, yes, there is. And I'm sure anyone that's been or escaped this, that's, you know, put in the work to support themselves. I've known of many people that have helped people leave or escape. Um, myself have helped about 15. So, and my house is a safe house for those people. Um, it can be very taxing. So, emotionally um because you're you're effectively ripping up old wounds and in, in helping them go through something very similar that you went through it can be very um triggering to to feel that again like ptsd um but there is a, a network of people out here that would happily help uh, people that that escape the same situation there's no like actual charity or, or corporation i know that and we're doing a lot with this podcast, um, which I was on recently. There's a group called Get A Life Podcast, which have a great network there. There's a New Zealand group called Olive Leaf Branch Network or something. Um, but just reach out to people um, that you know have left and we can direct you. So you started out saying that, you know, yes, I have trauma, blah, blah, blah. Why don't I just move on? Well, here's why. And I, I replied to you and I said, because I'm hoping it will help people. And you've come back and said, how will this help others? Um, I asked because we can lead a horse to water, but from my understanding, people flock to a false religion, whatever, whatever. Yes, I agree with that. You can lead a horse to water, but the difference is here. We're talking about a group of people, the cult that I was in that didn't know that there was water on the outside. They didn't know there was a better life on the outside. So in me speaking up about it, and as you said, why don't I move on? Not moving on is helping raise awareness to the people that might be watching this, to the wider community outside also that might be able to, might, and I've had a lot of people ask, how can I help? And I've got some, a neighbor I know, or someone else has reached out to me I know in the brethren that need help. So by raising awareness, you also help Others know that there is water on the outside. There is a better life on the outside of that dark, oppressive cult. Um, and yeah, so that, that's why I, I will not stop talking about it. And like I said in my previous video, um, if you watch that or a couple of videos ago, I will not stop talking about this until there are no abusers left in the exclusive brethren. So I've got a long road ahead of me because every single person I've contacted or come in contact with out here is no someone or is someone that has been abused by members of the exclusive brethren. So until my work here is done, then I'll move on. And if I just did and said nothing, I couldn't live with myself I, as it, as it has been already seven years for me to speak up about it. But that was, was because I had my own things to deal with. And, you know, I think, um, I've often had people say to me, it's, it's my calling here. It's been my, you know, the reason I, you know, not the reason I exist because it, as I said earlier, it doesn't define me, but I'm in a position to speak from my experiences and in, in doing so help somebody else that's still in there. And yes, I might be just the person that is helping leading them to water. You're right. You can't force them to drink. That's fine. But those people don't know that there's water out here. They don't know there's a better life out here. Thank you for your questions. Keep them coming. Have a good day, people. How can you support Get A Life podcast? You can donate internationally via PayPal at www.paypal.me forward slash get a life podcast. PayPal also has a QR code that can be scanned. Or donate to our Get A Life podcast GoFundMe.
If you're in a high demand religious group and need help, please go to oliveleaf.network. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me. Check out www.get-a-life.net for Get A Life merchandise, books, and ways to support or get support. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to Get A Life, and comment.